thinking in reference to what I just said. That when, when in, through study of the Shastras, especially Srimad Bhagavatam and Brahma Samhita, those two Shastras, and of course Prihad Bhagavatam Rita, you learn one thing, there's only Krishna. <laughs> That's all there is. <laughs> it's either, there's only two aspects to existence. Krishna and Krishna's energy. That's all. <laughs> and Krishna is Krishna, and everything is, is, is an expansion of Him. And so when you actually look at everything, there's, a, there's, just, there's just Krishna. That's all. Nothing else. There's, there's no other subject, and there's no other category of existence except Krishna. That's it. Who are we? We are is part and parcel, but we also are part of him. And in that sense, we are also the same as him. So in one sense, not that we're Krishna, but Prabhupada gave one lecture where he said, everything's Krishna, you're Krishna, I'm Krishna, we're all Krishna, it's all Krishna, there's nothing but Krishna. <laughs> and then, of course, later on, questions came. But Prabhupada wanted to make the point that actually existence is Krishna. There's nothing else. That's all. The energy of Krishna is also Krishna. And everything is either him or his energies. That's all. And we fall into the category of what is called marginal energy. We, we are part of his material energy in the sense that we have a material body. And we are actually his spiritual energy being his part and parcel. So in that sense, either look at any, looking at us from that perspective, or Krishna on one side or the other. <laughs> so that's, there's nothing else. Hari Bo. So what else is there to talk about? <laughs> Just Krishna. <laughs> or we can say, to be a little bit more, what do we say, uh, understanding, we say everything is Krishna, everything's in relationship to him. Therefore, everything in relationship to him, in one sense, is also all about him, too. And Prabhupada used to say that everyone is looking for love, everyone is looking for Krishna. They just don't know it. They just don't know it. Krishna is that, fun, that principle of existence that makes existence existence, and he's the principle of life that makes life life. <laughs> There's nothing else. Any questions? It's <laughs> just Krishna. So you look at it from upside down, that's when you can look at it from different sides, it's just Krishna. That's so that makes life really a symbol. <laughs> if we could just live, or come to that consciousness. And everything is about Krishna, and everything is Krishna. There's nothing to worry about. Perfection is to understand that our happiness and our success in our existence is simply to come back to who, who we are. That's all. We're just, we're on a journey that is a return journey from a journey that we shouldn't have made. <laughs> a journey away from the reality. But in that, 
and therefore we're, we're reversing the journey and going back to the reality. But in one sense, as Prabhupada says, you never left Krishna, which is dreaming you left him. <laughs> I mean, when you wake up from this material dream, you'll actually understand you never left him. <laughs> this is a dream, a created dream simply by the, the reflective mind, which is a, a feature of his one of his energies. That's it. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> And, and you, when we understand that, then we can see everything in relationship to that one principle. And nothing is separate from him, and everything is about him, really. So, that's it. That's the absolute truth. You really get that understanding when you read the Brahma Samhita. Because the Brahma Samhita actually takes that and breaks it down into different categories of existence and, and it all connects it all back to Krishna. Uvinda Madhi Purusham Tamaham Bhajami as Brahma concludes each of the verses as he describes the different realms of existence, the spiritual realm, the uh, Vaikuntha realm, the Goloka realm, the, the realm in between, the Brahman, the Shiva's abode, Brahma's abode, you know, and then all the various planetary systems, and then all the principles that make up existence, and the process of realizing Krishna. And that. It all comes back to Govinda Madhi Purusham Tamahamudan That scripture, Brahma Samhita, Prabhupada said, is really the, the more like Srimad Bhagavatam in a more in a nutshell. It's kind of like, you might say, a PowerPoint presentation on Bhagavatam, Rama Samhita. And when I first joined the Hare Krishna movement, I, I used to chant those verses regularly. And Prabhupada actually had them, you know, chanted every morning you know, to greet the deities. Vainam kantam karavinda dalaya taksam bhaharatasapam Sundara Gandharpa Koti Kamaniya Visheshu Sarva Govinda Madhi Purusham Tamaham Pujam. Such a, these, these prayers are so amazing. And they're so full of philosophical teachings on the Absolute Truth. And Prabhupada made some comments in, if, in looking and reflecting on on Prabhupada's lectures, you'll find practically every lecture he mentions at least one of the prayers in one in relationship to something he's saying. And he also said that we should, those who give classes, should also mention these prayers by Lord Brahma. There. And in the in the one of the final prayers, of course, towards the end, Krishna speaks to Brahma. And he actually sums up the whole process of how to realize him. And he says that one, by slow means, one should execute the activities of devotion. And he emphasizes three things. He calls it scriptural knowledge, proper conduct, Perseverance and practice. Krishna is kind of speaking. He calls him O Vidi. Vidi means learned one. Krishna is speaking to Brahma. O Vidi. The, the whole process can be summed up in these three things. Through, by practicing scriptural knowledge in the proper conduct, in, in the mood of perseverance, one can know me, he says. He sums the whole process up in these three things. Scriptural knowledge is that knowledge is coming from Guru, of course, who gives scriptural knowledge. Perseverance and uh, proper conduct, we were talking, you know, the entire class that uh, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu gave was about what conduct we should avoid. And we were just absorbed in hearing how to perfect our activities in such a way that we don't do things that will impede our spiritual life. So proper conduct is a, is a fundamental principle 
of the execution of the spiritual principles. And when it's and when we add determination to the <coughs> principle, perseverance and practice, then the whole thing becomes successful. Because in the Shastras, what is the conclusions of the Shastras? It is to love Krishna. That's it. <laughs> And Krishna says that in the Gita, and you call it the verse, Sarvasya Chaham Ridhisani Vistam Mata Smirta Gyanam Apohanam Cha Vedaisya Chaham Aham Eveda Vedam Vedanta Gur Veda Eva Chaham. The Vedas are compiled by me. I am the source of the Vedas. I know the Vedas, and the purpose of the Vedas is to know me. So all Vedic knowledge, which is the sum total of all transcendental knowledge, and also material knowledge, is geared to ultimately knowing Krishna. And knowing Krishna means serving Krishna, and serving Krishna means loving Krishna. So the whole thing is... That's why uh, Buddha Bhavarapu made a really amazing point where he said, really, you can really boil down the whole process into a few, few simple statements. Well, what makes up those simple statements are the activities that are involved. <laughs> but the, the statements itself are quite simple. Okay, I just got off on a tangent here. <laughs> this is not the subject matter of my talk, but I was just inspired by thinking that everything is Krishna. There's nothing else. Okay, so we're doing, we're doing the uh, prayers. Om Gyan Timurandasya Gyan Gyan Salakaya Chaksi Om Nidhitanya Natas May Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Namapishtam Stati Tanya Bhutala Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svam Padatika Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, we have done four prayers, and these four prayers correspond to the different levels of one's spiritual practice. And uh, that last prayer was on this platform of Ruchi. So the next stage is called a shakti. Now, a shakti means mature attachment for Krishna. On the platform of ruchi, there is attachment, but it's not mature. It hasn't reached its fully ripened stage. It's like a mango that is almost ripe, but not ripe. A mango that is almost ripe sometimes is edible, but when it becomes fully ripe, it becomes completely Tasty, sweet, and nutritious. So on this platform of Ashyakti, which means attachment to Krishna, for mature attachment, Lord Chaitanya gives a beautiful prayer. Ayi nanda tulu chikin kara patita mam vishyane bhavam budo kripaya tarapara pankasya stika duri savisham hisimsaya O son of Maharaj Nanda Krishna, I am your eternal servant. Somehow or other I've fallen into this ocean of birth and death. And then, a prayer of the heart. Please pick me up from this ocean of death and place me as a, an atom at your lotus feet. So, this is a prayer of longing. In the previous verse, one is... I don't want wealth, I don't want followers, I don't want displeasure, I don't want any, any kind of distinctions, none, none of these pleasures, of, I don't want liberation. Now, I don't want all these things, but now I'm still feeling the influence of being in the material world. I'm not with you yet. I'm attached to you. I don't want anything, but still I'm struggling in this world. So, please, you are very merciful. Someone, and he doesn't refer to, he calls Krishna the son of Nanda. So, when you refer to someone in relationship to somebody who's dear to you, it's a very dear expression. 
In other words, you become even more dear to a person when you refer to them in relationship to someone who's dear to them. So in this sense, he calls him O son of Maharaj Nanda, like that. So he's praying to Krishna in that mood. It's, a, it's begging for shelter and begging for service. Please pick me up and place me as, as an Adam Maturo to speak. Please engage me in your loving devotional service. I have no other desire, nor do I have any other interest. So, and then he says, this material world is like an ocean. But what is the, what is the ocean made up of? Birth and death. <laughs> Coming into this world, we get a material body. When our time's up, we, we relinquish that body. And as long as the living entity still has any iota of attachment, one again resumes the cycle in the ocean of birth and death, life after life. Vitche Maya Vese, Kachuha Bubu Bubu, Jeev Krishna Das, Hey Vishwash, Kali Na Adukanai, Bhakti Vinota Kor Praise. It's a beautiful prayer. I've been tossed by the waves of this material energy. And it's like a great ocean that throws the straws floating in the ocean from one side to another. Now, but I am your chief, I'm your, I'm your servant. Please give me shelter at your lotus feet. Give me full engagement in your devotional service. So this prayer actually takes us a little bit farther than just ordinary service. He wants to be situated in his eternal identity as Krishna's servant. So this is where the distinction is made in this particular prayer. He wants that, dis that position. Fix me as you're in my actual identity in relationship to my service to you. He wa he's wants to be fixed in his eternal rasa with Krishna, like that. And so, but he's feeling the same time, although he has no desires for material enjoyment, still tossed by the waves of the material energy. Still, I live in this body. There's an old, there's a saying that for a non-devotee, their minds are the greatest burden. And for the devotees, their bodies are a burden. Devotees' minds are happy, but their bodies are like, big lumps of anchors we drag around. Uh, it's like, you know, like, like pulling a 5,000-pound know, weight. Uh, it's like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but the bodies are happy. But there you get this big body to drag around. Even if it's small, it's still big because it's a weight. <laughs> so the devotees are feeling happy in their hearts, but at the same time, this body is just, oh. <laughs> Not that we, we don't want to surreptitiously or presumptuously get rid of the body. We want to free ourselves from the bodily conception of life by attaining our spiritual body and going back home, back to God, had to serve Krishna in that way. So in this verse, he's, he's really saying that this material world is really a place of suffering. But what is that suffering he's talking about? Not only the suffering of having a material body, but the suffering of being separated from you. So this prayer is a longing of the heart to be reunited with Krishna. And so that longing creates a type of suffering which causes the, the living entity to feel unhappy. And what is that unhappiness? The unhappiness is that I'm separated from you, which is a form of love, but it comes out in the form of unhappiness. We see that when we read about the residents of Vrindavan and how they're experiencing these same experiences when Krishna leaves. When Krishna leaves Vrindavan, goes to Mathura to take care of political business, and the residents of Vrindavan, all they can think about is when will Krishna come back? 
And the longer that Krishna stays away, the more they are, their unhappiness of, in separation. But because that unhappiness is another form of devotion, it brings a type of remembrance of Krishna that satisfies the heart at the same time causes distress. So they say love of God is like, it's like, if I can remember the actual verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita. Love of God is, is like a, it's more like a chutney. It's very sweet, but it burns also. <laughs> Turns into separation. And I think there's a nice verse that describes that love of God is like five ingredients, and four of them are very nice camphor, uh, sugar candy, uh, what else? There's no, four, four sweet and very pleasing, and the other one, the last one, is black pepper. <laughs> a little burning sensation here. So this is the nature of that, this verse is that the separation, the love is there, but the love is in a budding form. It's not fully reached its flower yet. It's on its way to perfection, a full love. When it reaches full love, then there's no question of wanting to, to, to remain in this material world again. There's very few people who are living in this world who have reached perfection in love with God. Once they've reached that perfection, they can't stay in this world anymore. And Krishna doesn't allow them. They takes, Krishna takes them back. Because the pain of that separation is too much for them to bear. That love becomes a, a, a source of... They die. <laughs> they just die out of love. <laughs> but this is not that stage yet. This is a very high stage. It's Ashakti. And all of one's karmic activities are, have been dissipated in the, in, the, in the fire of devotional service. Now, Nam, we have to understand one thing about these verses. The progression through these verses is the perfection of Nam. As Nam is chanted and is developed to higher and higher stages of pure, of pure chanting, one is moving through these stages. So Nam is the means to go through these stages here. And Nam brings full transcendental knowledge. As we mentioned in the first class, um, Vidya Vidhu Jivanam. Vidya means knowledge, Vidhu means bride, and Jivanam means the life. So just like a bride, she's getting married, and what is her happiness? The fact that she has a husband. And it's a, it's a new, newlyweds, just like in when you see newlyweds, they're really excited about everything. <laughs> Give them a little time, things change, but anyway. <laughs> Excitement takes off different angles of left, you, know, you get an obtruse angle, you get a right angle, you get a 90 degree angle, and so many angles coming later. But anyway, that's life in this world. Well, with Krishna, it's not like that. <laughs> But Krishna is not like that. So that, that, that bride is actually knowledge. And the groom is actually the holy name. So just like uh, it says that, just like a bride is inspired by the presence of a groom, it's simply the holy name. Gets, the transcendental knowledge gets life from the chanting of the holy name. The knowledge becomes awakened or full. So this is the first, fifth verse. One's body be starts to become spiritualized and one starts to develop Leela Seva. In other words, one starts to understand more and more gradually through the process, what is my internal relationship with Krishna? Krishna is slowly revealing that. Now, there is a class of transcendentalists who teach a certain process that when you reach a certain stage, then you find a Leela Guru, a guru who teaches you actually your Leela. And uh, in that instructions, you are instructed who you are, what is your service in the spiritual world, what is your transcendental color, what is your transcendental place of residence, what is your transcendental uh, uh, bodily form, your dress, everything. There's 11 points to this. 
And it's called, sometimes it's called, um, what is it called? Sudapanali, yeah. Or another one is called, uh, one is, is one's, uh, yeah, Sudapanali, yeah, Sudapanali. But um, the thing is, it's bona fide. That process of receiving this knowledge from a guru is actually part of the Vaishnava culture. But what happened was, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, when he was here at that time, people were surreptitiously and presumptuously adopting their, what we say, so-called Lila Smarnam just by imagination and various types of scriptural quotes they were reinterpreting. And people were acting in that way. And so Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati uh, took out that process from the, and then said that when you are ready, the, the spiritual master will enlighten you in your actual uh, spiritual identity like that. Prabhupada said it, yeah, the spiritual master will come and instruct you like that, when you actually reach that stage. Now this was so prominent, even in our Hare Krishna movement, in the early days, back in, I think around 1970, 71, a group of devotees had formed a club called the Gopi Bhava Club in, in our society, and they were actually dressing up as gopis, the men, and there was one devotee, he was dressing, he would walk around like a peacock, and somehow or other he concluded or received some knowledge that he was a peacock in the spiritual world. So you can hear the lecture with Prabhupada being informed about this club, and it's Tamal Krishna Goswami is speaking to Prabhupada, and, and Prabhupada said, this is not bona fide. He said, immediately disband that club. There were 50 people in the club, <laughs> five zero. So, the fact is that we do have a particular eternal loving relationship with Krishna. And the point is made that anyone who comes into this particular movement by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who is teaching Vrindavan pretty much has a relationship with Krishna in Sri Vrindavan. We are not so much inclined to Vaikuntha because Lord Chaitanya attracts people in that particular mood generally. Not completely, but that's the general mood. And so, one doesn't have to surreptitiously, you know, try to figure it out. One has to develop the mood. And actually, it's mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam and in other scriptures, also by Jiva Goswami and his Siddhartas. But Shiva Ram Maharaj has written, written a beautiful book, Spontaneous Devotional Service, I think it's called. And he explains how one reaches the higher stages by practicing Vaidhi Bhakti, the rules and regulations, under the guidance of a spiritual master, and at one point following in the footsteps of an eternal resident of Sri Vrindavan Dham. What does that mean to follow in the footsteps? It means to adopt a particular personality who you are attracted to, either a gopi, a, re a resident of Sri Vrindavan Dham in, in one of the three higher rasas and hear about that person, glorify that person and serve, try to understand their mood of service. And it's not about imitation, it's about glorification and the mood of service, developing that and, and hearing and glorifying and then if that is actually your mood, it will grow internally. If it's not, that, that resident, that eternal resident will show you where you are supposed to be. He will lead you, or she will lead you like that. Like that. So there's a process for developing the internal mood, which is Lila Seva. Yeah. Serving. So this, this verse is the preliminary stage of developing Lila Seva on the platform of Ashakti, like that. So one must have the qualifications to attain that. And once it starts to develop, and once one starts to understand their internal mood, and it starts to develop, one does not speak it. 
And one does not reveal it except to their spiritual master. That's the only person. If the spiritual master is not pres personally present, then one can find a person who is on the same level as their spiritual master. And under confidence, one can also discuss it and get further directions like that. But as soon as one talks about it, in general, oh, they start to lose that development. And gradually, it'll be gone. It's um, just like when Prabhupada was asked, well, who are you in the spiritual world? What is your identity? And the first time Prabhupada was asked that, he said, that you do not require. <laughs> In other words, none of your business. <laughs> and the second time he was asked the same question, he said, if I told you, you would faint. <laughs> so he never told us, although he was, you know, a very intimate associate of Krishna in Sri Vrindavan. Down that we know. But he never gave, he never revealed his identity because that is the mood of a Vaishnava. So as one reaches that stage, one does not reveal these things, only to, in confidence, to one's spiritual master. But uh, if you read Sri Ram Maharaj's book, it's amazing how he, he delineates how to practice this move of developing one's uh, coming to the stage of what is called spontaneous devotion. This is spontaneous devotional service here. The Shakti's on that path. It's still sadhana bhakti. It's not, it's got, it's got flavors of bhava, bhava bhakti, but it hasn't reached mature bhava bhakti yet. It's still in the flavor stage like that. You might say as a flower grows, it develops its leaves, its stem, and then it develops buds. As the buds start to be start to be influenced by water, sunlight, and proper cultivation, they start to open up and the flowers crazy. The flower is not fully developed on this stage yet, but the bud is there. Like that. So the bud of love of God is coming on this stage of a shakti. Like that. I mean this is pretty high stuff, but this is this is what the Shikshastakam prayers are about. This is what Shikh Shasta compares to the yes. Yeah. So that whole aspect of um, following the re on the residence of, of Vrindavan, so is that something that's practiced at this stage of the uh, Shakti, or what stage is that What stage is that proper on? It can even be practiced, yeah, it can be practiced on this stage, even in practice on the stage of Ruchi also. But you, if you don't give up to the, you don't give up Vaidhi Bhakti. You still follow the rules and regulations. Only when Vaidhi turns into spontaneous devotion can one execute the rules and regulations. And then there's rules and regulations for spontaneous devotional service also. Because because Sadhana Bhakti comprises both Vaidhi and and Raganuga. Baba Bhakti is a, is, a, is a complete distinct level of devotional service. Where rules and regulations are subordinate to the principle of devotion, loving devotional service. So we should know all these things because this, this is actually what we're aspiring to be, coming to these higher stages of Bhakti. Mahaprabhu did not reveal his internal bhajan. One should not reveal one's bhajan to others. Keep love hidden in your heart. There's a danger for revealing it also to your... Because either you'll see yourself in that way, or others will see you in that way. And that can ruin your humble devotional mood. Could cause you to develop a, a sense of pride which is contrary to your spiritual practice. Okay. So you keep it hidden. Uh, I don't know if this exactly complements what I'm saying, but I, I give you an example. Uh, I was I was giving lectures in New Jersey many years ago, many many years ago, 
And there was this one very nice young lady who was coming to my lectures. And then uh, one time she raised her hand during the question and answer session. She was saying, she was saying, you know, Maharaj Prabhupada comes into my dreams and he tells, he talks to me, and he tells me different things. And she was mentioning it, and I said, well, that's very nice, but um, it's not, we shouldn't talk about it. And so another lecture I gave, and she again mentions how again Prabhupada, again after she had said it, had also appeared in her dream. And it was a fact. There was no question. I didn't doubt her at all. I could see this was actually happening. She had a nice relationship with Prabhupada. But then afterwards, we talked for, on a one-to-one. -one. I said, listen, don't talk about this. It's something between you and Prabhupada. Keep it to yourself. If you continue to talk about it, you will, you'll find yourself losing that. So she listened. And then I was traveling in the airport. I was going from Bombay to London. And we happened to meet in the airport. And she came up to me and she said, Maharaj, Papa's not coming anymore. <laughs> she was getting regular visits by Papa, not just occasionally, regular. And she said, you were right. <laughs> I talked about it too much. She wanted to share her good fortune, happiness with others, but that wasn't the process. Something like that is very confidential. If you reveal it, you reveal it only to those persons who can give you confidential guidance like that. Not in the general, she was doing it in general, in the general sense. So, there might have been an element of pride in her own experience. But it, it was happening. There was no question about it. I could see it as soon as she said it. I knew she was explaining the truth. But, but that's not the process. So the same thing here is being mentioned that one's in, as one's internal love is developing in a certain mood, one does not reveal it. One gets advice from one's spiritual master and one's spiritual master is not there. One can pray to one's spiritual master and the spiritual master will guide that person to a person who can assist them. It's not, it's not a public thing. So when the devotees were doing that in, in our society and making a show out of it, Prabhupada said, stop it. He immediately stopped it. Not just, he didn't want to, because he knew this was all, you know, pretense. But there is a process, authorized process, that you go to a spiritual master who is called your Siddha Pranali Guru, and you get guidance like that. But Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati saw how it was being misused, so he removed it from the process, and then at the same time Prabhupada following in the footsteps of his spiritual master. But he writes, when the, when the candidate is ready, the guru will come and instruct and guide. So, we become ready simply by following the process. So. <coughs> Purifying the heart. In, in the stage of ruchi, one is more attached to the service. In the stage of ashakti, one is more attached to Krishna. <laughs> Is that, got that? In the stage of ruchi, one is more attached to the service. In the stage of ashakti, one is attached to Krishna, the personality of Krishna, and everything about him. So it's not that they don't serve, but the attachment is stronger to Krishna than it is to the actual service. And Krishna likes that. Because that's the goal, is to become attached to Krishna. Through Nam Sankirtan, spiritual attachment develops and naturally goes to the object of Krishna. So in that verse, Nam, what is it? Ayinanda Tanuja Kinkara Patitam Mambish Kinkara. Kinkara means what, whom, karomi. How can I develop my loving service to you? The devotee has an inclination of what they should do, but at the same time, out of humility, they're pleading to Krishna for guidance, for mercy, for service. 
So this the Shakti is very sweet. <laughs> it's the buds of love of God. Okay, so that's the fifth verse. I don't know how much more I can speak about it in terms of what I just said. Uh, there are many symptoms of that stage of the Shakti. Uh, one can sometimes feels the presence of Krishna, and then Krishna's gone, and then they feel unhappy. <laughs> or sometimes there is some elements that one can smell the transcendental body of Krishna. Krishna becomes present to the person by his aroma, by his, uh, he appears in the mind of the devotee and then he disappears at the same, you know, within a few seconds. And then the devotee's longing becomes more. Krishna does that. He want, he's only interested in increasing one's love for him. When love has a certain level of attachment, and that attachment brings one satisfaction and happiness. The Lord takes that, that budding, loving attachment and plays with it <laughs> by appearing and disappearing in different ways. And the devotee feels lost. <laughs> mm, there's the prayers by R Raghunath Das Goswami. He says, when I look at Govardhan Hill, it looks like a an ordinary mountain. And I, he looks at Vrindavan and he just, it's just like, it's, it's just a, a source of great unhappiness for him because he can't feel Krishna anywhere. Although it's Vrindavan Dham and all the glorious holy places are there in Vrindavan, as Krishna manifested in the form of his Dham, he's seeing the Dham, but at the same time he's not, he's not feeling the process of Krishna. So he describes that Devadam is giving him great pain. He sees it in, he's seeing it in, in a way of separation. It's just like if you love someone and that person dies and you see something that belonged to that person, you might start crying. You see an object that they, they used in their life, maybe if you even see their picture, or something, it brings back strong emotions of uh, what we say, love and expressed in a mood of unhappiness. <laughs> love is dangerous. It will cause you a lot of unhappiness. Be careful. <laughs> but there's no other route to go. Anyway, this is Krishna consciousness. But ultimately, the devotee reaches perfection. Any questions about uh, the, the, this fifth verse before I go on to the sixth? Yes? <coughs> yeah, this actually I was listening to a lecture by Tamal Krishna Goswami. He's making this point very strongly that generally in our society people who come to Krishna consciousness under the guidance of Lord Chaitanya's movement, have the mood of Sri Vrindavan Dham. There's other sampradayas who teach Vaikuntha, such as Madhvachari and Ramanujachari. So the, when a person is actually interested in engaging in devotional service, the Lord will direct that person according to their nature. But it's not absolute. We have the example of Marari Gupta, who was an associate of Lord Chaitanya. But Marari Gupta was actually an incarnation of Hanuman, who appeared in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes to assist the Lord. And the Lord played with him. Marari, don't you know Krishna's pastimes are more sweeter than Ram's? So you should actually become a devotee of Krishna. So Marari was listened because he had a lot of respect and then that night he was thinking about what the lord had said and he was thinking i can't give up my raghunath i can't and so he was like a whole night he cried and stayed awake the next day he came back and he was distressed and distraught fell at the feet of lord chaitanya and said i can't
can't follow your instructions. <laughs> I'm too attached to Ram. The Lord said, of course. And then he took, this was another time, he took uh, some Gopi Chandan and wrote Ram Das on his head for him. <laughs> so the Lord was just testing him to show the glory of his love for Ram. That when one is fixed in their eternal relationship, you know, one will only be satisfied in that relationship. <coughs> so in relationship to your question, yeah, we do, we may have devotees in our movement that have, or have, or are Ram Bhaktas or even the Shringa Bhaktas. But the general tendency is that people who are come to this movement are led by the mood of Mahaprabhu. Like that. The greatest commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam is who? Greatest commentary. Who is he? Who knows? That person who is considered the commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam. What's his name? Who knows? Sri Harsan. Who is his sister Dave? Lord Srinadev. He's his, his, his main deity, Lord Srinadev. So, but he, by worshiping Lord Nisringadev, as is this today, Lord Nisringadev is opening the doors for Vrindavan. Even Bhakti Thakur praised the Lord Nisringadev to bring him to Vrindavan. Okay. Does that help? Yes, but there is also additional aspect of the question. We are we just have to preach that song. We just have to spread the glories of the Holy Name, the glories of Sanatana Dharma. We don't have to see anything. The Lord will do everything. The Lord is, Krishna says, what does he say? As you surrender one to me, I, I reward you. He's leading us. He's leading the soul. He's leading everybody according to their level of practice and surrender. He's moving them. We're not moving them. We're just his instruments to attract people to the process and guiding them also. But ultimately, Krishna's moving internally. He's moving people in those different ways. He's the indwelling super soul in the hearts of all living beings. He moves the persons. He may direct a person to move another person in a certain way, but it's him that's doing everything. He directs the spiritual master. He directs the devotees. But ultimately, he's the director and the mover. <laughs> he's the prime cause, and he's the he's the he's the efficient cause, and he's also the immediate cause too. He's both. If you if we just follow the process accordingly, then that is you know, chant the holy names, eat Krishna prasadam. Engage in devotional service, avoid the offenses, follow the regulative principles, and everything is everything will happen by Krishna's arrangement. He's guiding. You still look very much bewildered. Is this a sign of ecstasy? No. <laughs> There's a, there also is certain ecstasies that come out in different ways. <laughs> I just heard that from Tamal Krishna Goswami when he was lecturing on, uh, and he made it. He made the point, backed it up with Shastra too. Yeah, of course. 
No, those who are choosing, we should encourage them in their choice. But if there's not, if they're not made a choice, you can encourage them in this way. If you read Bhagavad Gita, 1865, does anybody have the Bhagavad Gita, 1865? Brahman, you know, kind of reveals certain things in his purports that sometimes we don't even notice, which are really prime points. We have, yeah. Um, I think towards the end of the purport, Prabhupada makes the point of our identity as devotees. One should fix his mind on this original form of Godhead, Krishna. One should not even divert his attention to other forms of the Lord. Yeah. <coughs> Read that again nice and loud. One should fix his mind on this original form of Godhead, Krishna. One should not even divert his attention to other forms of the Lord. Yeah. The Lord has multi forms as Vishnu, Narayana, Rama, Varaha, etc. But the devotee should concentrate his mind on the form that was present before Arjuna. Concentration of the mind on the form of Krishna constitutes the most confidential part of knowledge. And this is disclosed to Arjuna because Arjuna is the most dear friend of Krishna. Yeah, because Prabhupada said, focus your consciousness on that form. He's telling us, as Vaishnava was under the guidance of Mahaprabhu. But we worship, we honor, worship Ram, the Shringadev, and all the, many of the other Lila incarnations, but well, we focus primarily on Krishna, because Mahaprabhu focused on Krishna. We are in that mood. Is that all right? Still other forms of ecstasy are exhibiting there. <laughs> Can't figure out the, the latest one. No, we shouldn't discourage anyone according to their practice. The Prabhupada said, even if a person is practicing another religious system, you don't discourage that. But to speak about, you know, different forms of the Lord. Okay. Uh, Sri Devi, yeah. You mentioned that sometimes devotees in our movement also they are attracted to Lord Nashidade or Lord Ram and so on. So my question is, is there a possibility that devotees could uh, be headed towards Vaikuntha planets rather than Golok Vrindavan? And if so, yeah, the is possibility less, is there. Is that a less desirable position or is it the same? Well, Mahaprabhu is offering Vrindavan. <laughs> But Prabhupada also mentions that one can, one can change if one is destined for Vaikuntha, one can make, you know, follow the sadhana for uh, Raghunuga Bhakti and actually come to the stage of Vrindavan Dham. Now it's interesting, this is it. Those who worship Radha and Krishna in the mood of awe and reverence, go to Vrindavan, and there's a section of Vrindavan where Radha and Krishna are offered, are worshipped in awe and reverence, in Vrindavan Dharma. And that was revealed when, when Nanda Maharaj was captured by Varuna, in that particular pastime. And then, when Varuna was glorifying Krishna, Nanda Maharaj was amazed to hear that glorification of his son because he has a lovely relationship as parental affection. And then there were other residents of Vrindavan there and Krishna revealed a section of Vrindavan where he and Radharani are worshipped in awe and reverence. So one who worships Radha and Krishna in awe and reverence contained Vrindavan in that area of Vrindavan where they worship Radha and Krishna or in reverence. But that is, you know, 
that's available. So in other words, any mood of worship is facilitated in some realm of the spiritual world. Any realm of, any type of worship of the Lord in his different forms are facilitated either through Vaikuntha or Vandava. We honor, you know, we, we honor Lord Nishrikadev as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But when Pallad Maharaj, we, Pallad Maharaj was not a worshiper of Lord Nishrikadev. He was a worshiper of Krishna. But Krishna appeared to him in that form because that was the form that was necessary in order to, what we say, kill the demon and give protection to Pallad Maharaj. But he was a he was a devotee of Krishna. Yeah. Um, Nikanta. Well, you can, not a human, you can have a, a human-like form, but it's not human, it's spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. Every, every living entity in the spiritual world, in whatever form they take, has pure love for Krishna. Because everything is sentient. The rocks are sentient, the trees are everything has pure spiritual consciousness. Although it has a particular form to serve Krishna in that particular form. So there are five rasas. So neutrality exists in the spiritual world also in the mood of serving Krishna in these different living entities, such as trees, rocks, like that. And as you mentioned, deers, cows, they're all pure devotees. And they're all fully conscious of Krishna. But they exhibit that service according to the type of body they have. Because <laughs> Krishna likes variety. And variety makes life, life. Without variety, there's no life. So where does the variety in this world come from? And Prabhupada said it's a reflection of the reality. So when you look in the mirror, and you hold a, an image in front of the mirror, what's reflected in the mirror is simply a reflection of the reality that is outside the mirror. So what we see in this world is simply a reflection of the reality. And in the re reflection, the same pr principles of the reality look like the same, but they're not the same. In the reality, there is no death, and in the reflection, there is death. In the reality, there is only happiness. In the reflection, there is a mixture of happiness and distress. So, so the reflection looks like the reality. And why? Because it comes from the reality. So this world is... So we have a, we have a form like Krishna. Two arms. Krishna's original form is two arms, two legs, like that. His manifested forms, as in Vaikuntha, he has four arms. And sometimes in Lord Nishringa has eight arms. <laughs> but his original form is a two-armed form, which is a human-like form. Yes, the uh, looks But what does what has function and not function? So it, it helps to uh, to get at another stage of uh, of bhakti, or or it inspires, or uh, I mean, it's uh, it's necessary to uh, to get to know this form, or it, it, it's, it's the form is actually manifesting internally as you practice. It's developing. You may not, at a certain stage, it becomes more perceivable. You have a tendency to want to serve Krishna in a particular mood. 
as a gopi, as a coward boy, as a uh, parent like that. It grows. It's growing by our, what we say, the power of own de our own devotional service. When you reach these stages, it starts to uh, become more apparent. Mm. And then when you reach the higher stages, you actually know. It's revealed to you through your bhakti. But that, the process is mentioned by Shiva Ramaraj very, very expertly in that book, Spontaneous Devotional Service. He's done an amazing job with that book. If you, and it clears a lot of misconceptions about how to reach higher levels, how to practice spontaneous devotional service, how one goes from Vaidhi Bhakti to spontaneous devotional service, how to practice the pra and it's, it's complete. Um, so if you read that, he's taking references from all the major shastras that deal with this, and he's condensed it down in a very understandable and sequential explanation of how to practice you know, spontaneous devotional service. Huh? Yeah. So it's all from scripture. I mean, if we have to understand this by reading the scriptures, we have to read a lot of scriptures. <laughs> The scriptures give you hints, you know, Bhagavatam gives you some, uh, Jiva Goswami is giving some in his Sandarbhas, Rupa Goswami is giving some in his uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. It's all there in bits and pieces. Jiva Dharma gives a very, very nice explanation of all these things. But then as we read these things, we get misconceptions, unless we have explanations from the Charyas. So what was the misconception in ISKCON that people surreptitiously or just presumptuously started to practice what they thought was their internal mood without actually having it developed it. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? more ecstasy. <laughs> yes. Raj, in the, in the purport to 1865 Prabhupada, you mentioned that we should focus on yeah. the form of Krishna as Arjuna sees him. So then, what does that mean to... We're followers of Lord Chaitanya. We worship Krishna. What does that mean to... If you don't like it, get out of the... <laughs> so, <laughs> Join this, you know, Sri Sampradaya. <laughs> I don't want Krishna, I want something else. <laughs> no, is that, that's not your question. <laughs> so, a Nasimha Bhakti, for example, should he then worship Nasimha Dev with? He can also worship, like, yeah, he can worship, he can offer beautiful prayers, and he can also do puja to Nasimha Dev. And ultimately, you know, but but following Lord Chaitanya, we are. What are we chanting? The Hare Krishna mantra. What is the Hare Krishna mantra? It's uh, it's Radha and Krishna. Hare is Radharani's name in a vocative form. In Krishna. So you're calling out to Radha and Krishna when you chant the Hare Krishna mantra. It doesn't, we're not minimizing the other incarnations and we're not even saying we shouldn't worship them. But in Lord Chaitanya's movement, he wanted, we, we, we meant to focus on Krishna. So we worship the Siddhartha with the understanding that he's yeah. also Krishna, but in that another form. But he's in the mood, the mood of Vaikuntha, so you worship him with awe and reverence. Ultimately, you can only worship Krishna in spontaneous devotional service when one no longer has the mood of all reverence. But that's the that's the Vrindavan mood, where you're, where these three higher mellows are the essence of the Vrindavan practice, and that's always done as Krishna is either equal or subordinate. When Prabhupada is teaching us the process, just like. 
we see on the altar, you see Radha and Krishna on the altar, right? I mean, this is really high level. <coughs> Are we worshiping Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan? No. We're, all, we're worshiping Radha and Krishna in the mood of Vaikuntha. So therefore, Prabhupada says, we're actually, Radha and Krishna in, in front of you is actually Lakshmi Narayan, because that is the actual worship that we're performing. You don't, you don't worship Radha and Krishna other than spontaneous loving devotional service. We're following rules and regulations according to Pancharatra Gividi, which is Narada's teachings on how to worship the deity. Like that. So, but we're, we're seeing Radha and Krishna in front of us, but we're worshiping. But Prabhupada says when you reach that stage of spontaneous devotional service, then the deities will reveal to you them as Radha and Krishna. That mood will develop. So Prabhupada said, but don't try to jump up to that. Don't don't go. He said, don't try to jump onto the shoulders of the deity. I say, Krishna, let's go out and play into that. He said, you can't do that. You get the point. So yeah, the mood is Vaikuntha, but ultimately, when we want to come to that mood and burn down. That's the goal. And if your mood is like Gunta, you'll that will be revealed to you. See, Krishna consciousness is not only philosophical explanations, it's revelation. The revelations happen on the higher levels when, when philosophy matures into realizations. Philosophy is not meant to mean remain in a theoretical sense. It's meant to take us to the point of realizing the philosophy in practice. And through that realization, we get understandings of our relationship with Krishna. And then we want to act in that relationship. And so it says that this says in this move, one is hankering for their Lila Seva. How, to, how can I come to my stage of worshiping according to my loving, my natural loving propensity? So we're preparing ourselves for that. Yes, uh, Janaki Nath Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, you mentioned... Can you stand up? <laughs> I can't see you, that's why. I'm sorry. Maharaj, you mentioned Lord Chaitanya came to give us Vrindavan, but we were in the Madhva Sampradaya, and he's, he came to give... Uh, Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya. Bra Brahm is our, our uh, head of our Sampradaya. Brahma was initiated by Krishna himself into the Gayatri Mantra. And therefore he actually took on this did Brahma actually took on the mood of of like of Vrindavan. So Brahma's ahead of our Sampradaya. Mud was there, but we're not in the mood of Aishwarya. Although we practice the worship in the mood of Aishwarya, we're in the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We're following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So it's Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Sampradaya. How did Madhva get into that? Uh, Lord Chaitanya appeared to Madhvacharya and told him, I will appear in your Sampradaya. In 200 years from now, I will appear in your Sampradaya. Much because the other sampradaya, which is the Rudra sampradaya, their goal is Vrindavan. Yeah. So it's just, it's just and also the uh, Pushti mark, they're also Vrindavan. So I just want to clarify one thing. You said Vrindavan is the goal for Vrindavan, there is all reverence worship. This, yeah, this was brought out by the pastime of, uh, you read that pastime, Mar Varuna captures Nanda Maharaj because he bathes too early, he breaks the rule. And he's captured by the servants of Arun and taken to the watery kingdom. And then, you know, Krishna is looking all over for his father and he finally realizes that Krishna comes and deals with Varuna and gets his father back. And then when he's there, Varuna is worshiping Krishna in a very, very reverential way. And all, and and Nanda Maharaj is seeing this along with other cowherd men who are also there. And they're thinking, that's our, you know, that's our boy. 
And look at this big demigod, and he's worshiping. So Krishna revealed that there is a place in Vrindavan where he's worshipped in all levels. He showed them Vrindavan in Aishwarya. Any, any devotees who have attachment to Krishna and all reverence will go to Gola Vrindavan anyways, isn't it? No question of that. Well, that all reverence, if it reaches that stage, you know, of perfection, they can go to that section of Vrindavan, which is all reverence. But if it turns into spontaneous loving sentiments and develops into the mood, of the higher mellows, such as Sakya Ras, Vatsaya Ras, and Madhurya Ras, then they'll, they'll be in Vrindavan in that, in, in one of the three Rasas like that, which is not, there's no awe and reverence in that. There's no awe and reverence at all. Krishna doesn't like that. When Mother Yasoda looked into the mouth of Krishna, she saw the, the entire universe, and then she starts saying, oh, my son is God. Krishna started to realize my mother's mood is changing. He would rather be chastised by his mother, tied up and punished, than worshipped and with nice people. Yeah. This is Krishna. Krishna has Adarya and Madhurya. Madhurya is actually Krishna, his sweetness. His sweetness is he exchanged loving sentiments in these higher rasas as friends, when someone worships you as God, it's not so great. But when someone loves you because you are you, there's a, there's a nice thing. <laughs> this is really funny. <laughs> it happened in a place called Vrindavan. It's called Hashivan. Hashivan is a place of laughter. <laughs> so the cowherd boys just come up to Krishna and say, Hey, Krishna. How do you kill all these big demons? What's your secret? <laughs> you know, you're just like one of us, but you're killing all these big demons. Another boy said, he chants these special mantras that are secret. He's not telling us. <laughs> Another boy says, no. His mother puts on these special amulets on his arms, and that's where he gets his power from. There's only other boys say different things. And Krishna says, you really want to know? They say, yeah. They gather around. And Krishna says, you know, when I was first born, one great sage came to my house and talked to my father. His name was Garga Muni. And he said, this boy is actually just like Lord Narayan. In fact, he is Lord Narayan. So actually, I am the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's telling this to the cowherd boys, and the cowherd boys are looking. Well, just listen to him. <laughs> and they're saying, they're thinking. First, their first reaction is, wow, really? And then they start to laugh. <laughs> and they say, all right, Krishna, let's go play. <laughs> so this place is called Hasyavan, because when Krishna was speaking like that, the trees, the plants, and everything around it was laughing. <laughs> and Krishna just revealed, did you really know, you should really know that I am God. <laughs> and the coward boy saying, whoa. <laughs> Gee, that's great, but let's go play. <laughs> so there's a lot of laughter in between while uh, Krishna's explaining his, and then Krishna says, okay. <laughs> Uh, that's in that's in Shiva Ramaraj's. You read that part? Yeah, that's it. Did I get it right? Can you fill in? Because oh. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking if I left something. When I read that, I was laughing so hard I couldn't stop. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> when I just think about it, it's just funny. <laughs> because it, it, it just invoked laughter, laughter from the whole environment. It says, right, the trees, the plants, the animals, the water, the, the cow, everybody was just laughing as Krishna was explaining he was God. <laughs> and then after it was all over, they said, all right, we're going to go play now. <laughs> so, yeah. 
So they don't care if he's God. They don't really want to know he's God. And if, even if they, he, they, they actually understand he's God, they just push it aside. And then they forget about it. And that's what Krishna likes. Krishna's yoga maya potency makes these relationships, keeps these sweetness of relationships where Krishna is worshipped or associated with in a mood of love. It's pure love. They play with Krishna in a love. They serve Krishna in a, as a boy in a pure love. They're so attached to him as who he is and not so, not so much the principle that he is God himself. They don't care. That's Vrindavan. That's Vrindavan Dham. So even though Madhvachari is there, still our prominence is Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya is only about Vrindavan. He's only about Vrindavan. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Mahayanya. So you're, you're, you're wondering why Madhvachari is in there? That was, that was Lord Chaitanya's mercy. Because he took two principles from each of the four sampradayas as his guiding principles for his practice. And from Madhva, he took two things, the worship of the deity and the complete refutation of Mayavad philosophy. The Madhvacharyas are foremost in destroying the Mayavadis, even more than the, uh, the Ramanujis. I, was, I went to an interfaith conference in 2004 in Bar Barcelona, Spain. I was with His Holiness Sri Dhammadar Goswami. And we went, and there was a panel discussion as part of the practice. And there was two or diff three different, there was five people, two or three different types of uh, Christians, and I think there was an uh, Islamic person, and then there was one Madhva on the panel. So the idea was to present your philosophical teachings to the audience. I was in the audience. But this Madhva, he broke all the rules. He started to challenge each one of them and, wanted, and started to debate with them. And then the monitor said, well, this is not a debate. He said, no, 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 no. He was challenging all their philosophy. He was a mudva. Mudvas are like that. They're fighters. They're fighters against anything that's not pure devotional service or pure according to Madhvacharya. They have that mood. And especially the Mayavadis. Very strong. You read the life of Madhvacharya. It's just one encounter after another with the Mayavadis. So Lord Chaitanya was very strong to make sure that Mayavadi philosophy was, didn't filter into our Sampradaya. So the Madhvas are also there. Does that help? I'm doing my best to convince you. <laughs> you're, you're, you have another form of ecstasy that I can't really oh decipher. It looks like bewilderment <laughs> along with doubt but at the same time, you look quite happy. <laughs> so it's one of these mixed emotions. <laughs> Continue? Yeah. yeah. I want to just thank that was advocate. Could somebody accuse us that, you know, we want to be connected to one of the four Sampradas, so we just chose Madhva, so then we can say, oh, we come from a specific We didn't choose, chose it. Lord Chaitanya brought Madhva into the Sampradaya. Because he appeared to him and instructed Madhva. Yeah, Madhvacharya heard from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Well, this was right after Madhvacharya went to see uh, Vyasadeva in Bhadrinath. He went twice. The second time, the Lord Chaitanya appeared to him. He said, I'll be, I'll be appearing in your Sampradaya in 200 years. And he also gave him instructions like that. That's mentioned in the life of Madhvacharya. 
The details of those instructions I haven't come across, but through some research, it could reveal much more. There was another hand up somewhere, I saw. Let's see. Uh, yes. Um, your hand up. Uh, Mr. Pree? Uh, you're, just, you're just waving. Huh? <laughs> okay. They assist Radha and Krishna in their pastimes. As Buddha Bhavana made a very nice point, they have more intimate associate than Radha and Krishna than the gopis do, than the principal gopis. Because they're, they're young, they're, they're usually very young, and ten, between 10 and 12 years old, and they're simply there to make arrangements for Radha and Krishna's. Sometimes Vishaka and Lalita appear to assist also. But most of the main gopis don't. It's the manjaris that do all the uh, assisting. No, it's Madhurya. It's all pure Madhurya ras. No, it's more intimate. There's a, a nice discussion that's brought out by Shiva Ram Maharaj in one of his books. Um, maybe our son and Patanji can help me with this, where it's an exchange between Rati Manjari and Radharani. It's all the pastimes of Rati Manjari's associate. Uh, a service to Srimati Radharani. Rati Manjari is Raghunath Das Goswami. And he's in one of the Indian. Rupa Goswami and, Rat, and Raghunath Das Goswami are intimate Manjaris. Okay. And this, in this particular delineation, I can't remember the name of it, the service and the association of Radharani become very, very intimate. Well, even more intimate than what Radha Rani would reveal to other, some of the other chief gopis. And there's a reason for that also. They can, they, because they're in that, they're a younger, and they don't compete for Radha Krishna's association, or sometimes the other gopis compete for, to get Krishna's association. So yeah, Prabhupada, it's mentioned that we are, we're trying to practice our devotional service in such a way to give Radha and Krishna pleasure. In other words, to bring Radha and Krishna together. Sri Devi? That's up to you. I mean, uh, Prabodhananda Saraswati is absorbed in Lord Chaitanya. And Prabodhananda Saraswati is an incarnation of the, the Gopi Tanga Vidya, which is one of the principal Gopis. She's there in the form of Prabodhananda Saraswati. Oh, no, not Prabodhananda Saraswati. What am I saying? Is it Prabodhananda Saraswati? Yes. Yeah. Pra yeah, the uncle of uh, Raghuna, uh, the uncle of Gopal Bhatta Goswami is Prabhupada Namaskar as well. And so he's, he's appeared in, uh, when he, you read his writings, he only wants to know about Lord Chaitanya. He, don't want, he doesn't want to know about any other aspect of the Supreme Personality of God. So if you're worshipping Lord Satan, you're worshipping Radha and Krishna. There's no difference. Except the mood is slightly different. 
to worship Lord Chaitanya by spreading the Sankirtan movement, by engaging in Harinam Sankirtan. Yes? You mean that a practitioner is feeling separation from Lord Chaitanya? Yeah, why not? Because, I don't know, if you desire to reach the state, you are in the spiritual world now, so if you feel this separation? Uh, in the spiritual world, there is the mood of separation. But Krishna, you know, he leaves and goes someplace else. <laughs> so they... Mother Yasoda can't wait till he returns. She's feeling that mood of separation and love. The gopis don't get as much association with Krishna as the cowherd boys do. So they're always hankering for Krishna because Krishna is mostly during the day. He's out herding cows and playing with his friends. They get his association in the morning when Radharani cooks for him. And then when he comes back in the evening for his nocturnal aspects. But during the day, he's with his friends. So they're all feeling separation when he's somewhere else, apparently somewhere else. They can't stop thinking of him. Uh, they're either they're thinking of him in love constantly. There's no break in that thought pattern. And it's always how to serve him in such a way that he's pleased more and more. They're always thinking how to please him more and more to their service. So when they're when they when they're not with him, they're either longing to be with him or planning to to serve him when he when they see him again. Can't stop thinking of it. That's the spiritual world. Even if they wanted to stop thinking about it, they couldn't. It's not possible. <laughs> They just can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's not possible. Fire ball. <laughs> okay, so it's 8.10. I think we were supposed to end because we started a little late. But uh, it'd be nice if everyone can make the Shine Arti at 9 o'clock tonight. It would be beautiful. Expression get to get a chance to see Shishi Radha Gokulananda again. But before we end, is there any announcements? Yes. Uh, come over here so we can see you. They say if you can see you, we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And tomorrow we'll finalize our talks. And uh, Ruta Bhavana will be giving a class tomorrow morning here, and I give one in a Srimad class tomorrow. Thank you. And then there's a disciples meeting at 12 o'clock, from 12 o'clock onward up until lunch. And that'll be, I don't think we're allowed, to, yeah, we can have, yeah, disciples meeting is here. It's here. And then lunch will be the final uh, activity. Now, disciples mean, means that anybody can come, but it's going to be about disciples like that. So, but it's open to anyone if you want to come. Sorry for taking your service. <laughs> Thank you, Shmarad. It was really, really wonderful class. Amazing realizations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have to empty the hall by half past eight. It's already quarter.